Great, how are you? Fantastic, man. Doing interviews all day and and uh, doing great. Doing really great. Okay, yeah, I was a little worried there because like you didn't show up last time and I was like, I just like yeah. thoughts start, start going through my head with your oh, head dude. and everything. I start to get worried like- Oh, oh dude, you know, you know what it was? I was talking to a guy uh, from South America and, and he kept going and going, which was great. And I didn't really, I wasn't keeping track of the time. And uh, it got to be like 544 and I'm like, oh God, okay, all right. And he kept going. I didn't end until 552. I'm like, so I told uh, Martinez, please, yeah, let him know we'll reschedule, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I just got, you know, kind of tied up with him, but I'm here oh, now. Okay. okay, that's great. Yeah. Do you have a? Perfect. Now, are you? You got to get off for another one to uh, after this one too? No, I think this is the last one until eight o'clock. So I'm good, man. Take your time and and fill it up. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, I have first thing I was gonna ask you is this most recent thing you guys just played at the NFC Championship game? Journey did yes. with a. How yes. was that? Yeah, unbelievable, dude. I mean, just, you know, I mean, we're, we're 49ers fans by proxy. I mean, Neil and those guys are from San Francisco. I'm an Oregonian. There's no football teams. The Seahawks, not so good this year. Um, so we had to be uh, 49ers fans. And man, they they pulled it out. We didn't, I didn't think it, they were going to be able to, to to pull it out. But man, quite a nail biter at the end there, man. I was pretty impressed. And, uh, yeah. you know, of course we take responsibility because it was our halftime performance that just riled them all up. <laughs> it, it did make it. Yeah. It was the second half where they came yeah. back. I think I was yeah. rooting for the lions just cause I'm a Seahawks fan. So I'm against yeah. the 49ers division plus lions. You just feel so bad for them, but good Dude, game. Totally. I mean, a 30 year drought and to see him come back that hard and that heavy, and then to lose it just on a, on a few mistakes, you know, nothing major, but you know, still it was, you know, vital, you know, pretty heavy, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Like, uh, I don't know if people know that, that you grew up in Oregon and that you were, you were in a band with the guys from uh, black and blue, right? Yeah. Well, one of the guys, Jamie St. James, the lead singer was actually the drummer for wild dogs, which was a metal band out of Portland. And uh, Jamie, you know, moved to LA to do black and blue. And they, so wild dogs were looking for a drummer. And um, I was 16 at the time uh, playing in a oh. club in Portland and Matt, came the lead singer came down and said this kid's pretty good so they they hired me and but but the guitarist jeff who i love he's a brother he's like well he plays too loud and he plays a lot he's really busy and uh he doesn't look right and you know because i had short hair and stuff and it was like well, but they gave me a shot man at 16 and recorded my first record with him um at 17 it was pretty cool is that how you ended up getting um to the attention of the um, shrapnel records guy. Yes, uh, Jeff Mark was on the the U.S. Metal Volume Two, I think, um, which was all those Shredder guys. Derek Frigo was on it. Josh Ramos, Marty Friedman, all these monster players. And um, Jeff had it with this song called "The Tonight Show." And Jeff, believe it or not, was doing the Eddie stuff before Eddie was doing that, but he was up in Portland. I mean, he was doing all that stuff because, you know, the dogs were together from like 77, 78. Then Van Halen came out. I was like, he plays like Jeff. You know, it was, it was crazy, you know, but uh, you know, not the same, obviously, but you know, he had the same, those, uh, the, the triple picking, you know, the, the finger picking thing down, they were doing that. So uh, Jeff got the call from Mike Varney and then Mike Varney uh, saw me play and said, you know, you're pretty good. Would you like to do some, some uh, records for me as a, you know, like a studio drummer? I'm like, yes. So I literally um, did records for, for Mike, like Marty Friedman's Dragon's Kiss and Cacophony and Joey Tafoya, James Murphy, all these guys for like really cheap, like, you know, 150 bucks a record, we, you know, cause Mike didn't have a big, um, uh, a big budget, but yeah, it was such a great experience for me, man, to, to play with all these great players, man. And now they're, most of those guys are freaking massive, you know? Yeah. Did, so did you, when you were young at a young age, did you like, I don't know what the term is like envision, or did you try to like, uh, have like a vision board or like manifest these like future things of playing with journey and Ozzy and stuff, or did it just happen from hard work and, uh, and continuing to practice? Well, dude, I, I was what you call a Ritalin kid. You know, they gave kids that had that were really AD, ADD, they gave them Ritalin to speed. You know, they gave them Ritalin to calm them down. And my mom, you know, I was on it for maybe, I don't know, three weeks to a month. And, and I was a zombie. I went from being ultra hyper to like a dead man. And she was like, I, I don't like this. I, I, you know, she didn't like it. She took me off of them and she, she and my dad bought me a drum set. And I never looked back, dude. I wanted to be in one or two bands, either Kiss 
or Van Halen. And since I look crappy in spandex, or a uh, uh, journey, I'm sorry, yes, a journey. And since I look crappy in spandex, I, I got the journey gig. So it was, I knew what I was going to do at a young age, man. And nobody could stop me. My father was like, well, you need to have a plan B. I'm like, there is no plan B, dad. I'm going to do this. And how are you going to make it out of Salem, Oregon? I mean, how are you going to do this? I'm, I don't know, but that's what I'm doing. And Wild Dogs was my calling card. Mike Varney, you know, Matt McCourt. And then, of course, Neil. You know, Neil discovered me in a rehearsal studio playing with Tony McAlpine. And um, took me under his wing and Bad English was born, you know. And he's taken me ever since, everywhere he went, with the exception of my three years with Ozzy. I, I was with Neil. Yeah, did you? So you never got a chance with Kiss? Like, they never? you never tried to throw your hat in the ring to audition for that band because they had some I was, this, I was this close dude when eric Carr, god rest his soul monster yeah, drummer yeah. when he passed uh i got the call from gene simmons mike varney actually sent them my uh my bio and uh, i talked to to gene and to bob ezrin and um it was just before revenge and um mike i, I guess called you know maybe a month later and asked what the status was and they said well he's not the right look he's too heavy because i was a big big kid back then so they're like yeah he's just not the right look so they got eric which was the perfect choice eric's phenomenal um so that worked out but yeah it was i was this close dude but yeah they yeah. would have to like put you know spanks and stuff all over me <laughs> i was a big kid <laughs> yeah well what about that band um i don't think a lot of people probably ask you about this but you were in that band hardline i love that band personally I, you guys had a little bit of success. You had uh, songs in the Brandon Lee movie and on an episode of Baywatch. You toured with, uh, didn't you do some shows with Van Halen and uh, Extreme? Yep, we did Van Halen, Extreme, uh, and Mr. Big. Those were our yeah. three big tours, you know, and dude, what a great band. Johnny Gioelli, who's still a wonderful friend of mine, still sounds just like he did back then. You know, vocalists start to lose it after a while. He sounds the same. He's still got all the power. He's such an amazing front man. And actually, he produced my vocals on the last uh, the last two um, uh, Revolution Stage records. So very fortunate to have him as a brother and, and a producer. Just amazing. So yeah, Hardline was, we did pretty good. I, we'd been there five years earlier, like maybe, you know, 87. We probably would have been big, you know, because it was around the time of, of um, Bon Jovi and Johnny sounded very similar to John. I, yeah. It could have been huge, bro. Could have been huge. He but does. Nirvana. Yeah. Yeah, if people go go back, I think they could still check out that album, like Rhythm from a Red Car, Life's a Bitch. Those two songs are like, they're so good to me. Like, I think oh, they, they you, fit right in with the Bon Jovi stuff. You're right. I think so. And, you know, and then you got Neil, who's a shredder and a half, man. You know, a blue oh, shredder. It, it was killer. Just a great band, but just a little too, too late. Yeah. So he, so Johnny produced your vocals. I thought uh, Alessandro produced the album or you have two producers. He produced the record, but, but Alessandro was busy doing uh basics with another band. So they asked if Johnny would do it. And you know, Alessandro's a fantastic songwriter and he's busy all the time. So they were like, well, let's have Johnny do it. So um, I was in uh, Portland and we did it zoom like this, you know, we had a, a, a screen up and a camera and, um, you know, he helped me through every line, you know, just helped me work through every line. He will try it with this kind of feeling and, you know, get into the character of it. And he taught me a lot, bro, because, you know, I'm not I'm still learning how to be a lead singer. You know, I've been in Journey and I've sang lead, you know, Journey a few times and stuff, but it's different trying to be your own guy, you know, and I'm not that I'm still learning who I am as a vocalist. So, I mean, drumming, I'll, you know, I'll always keep my day job. That's that's where I am the happiest. But um you know, so I'm still learning and growing, but Johnny pulls a lot out of me. And Alessandro as well pulls a lot out of me. They're really good at, at, at knowing my vocal potential, what I can do, what I can't do. And uh, they work with me and it's 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 been great. Just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the journey. I mean, there is some similarities. And I think you'd be the first to admit it between you and Steve Perry on this exactly. new Revolution Saints or, or all the Revolution Saints stuff that you've done. There's definitely some similarities there. Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of hard not to. Steve was my, I had three vocal influences. I had Steve Perry, who's the biggest, um, Paul Stanley, and uh, Ronnie Dio. Those are my three favorites of all time. So, you know, I can't help but, you know, sound a lot like Perry because I'm doing the backgrounds and I was a huge Journey fan. I mean, I was playing that stuff at 11 years old with guys who were like 24, 25 years old. And uh, so I had to learn the stuff. And since I hadn't hit puberty yet, I could hit these high notes. You know, so they make me do it, you know, and that's how I learned to sing was listening to Steve. And of course, I'm not, you know, nobody's going to be close to him. I mean, you get close, but 
they'll never be him. And I'm, you know, I'm just grateful that I can do the songs the best that I can and the fans accept it. Because if they didn't, I would stop. <laughs> I would be like, yeah, I'm done. Because they're they're tough. Journey fans are tough. I mean, Steve Perry, Steve Perry. I mean, how do you, you know, get close to sounding like that? Especially me being a smoker. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's weird. When I sing, my vocal comes out nice and clear. I don't get it. You know? That is crazy. Yeah. That, I, so you're still smoking, though? Yeah, dude, you know, I still got my, my American spirits. Yeah, I, I, you know, I quit about six months ago. I just woke up one morning and said, you know what, I'm done. And I had no cravings, uh, no irritability, no withdrawals, none of that stuff. It just kind of went away. And then uh, my my daughter was having um, issues uh, with one, with her pregnancy. And they, they didn't think that she was going to make it, uh, which was scary as hell. So instantly I grabbed the cigarettes, man, and I'm chain smoking like a mother. You know, thank God she came out of it. Baby's great. She's great. But yeah, I, I started up again. So I've been smoking about two months now, again. So I'm hopefully, but I'm cutting down. I've done really well. I, I do maybe four or five cigarettes a day instead of, you know, a pack. So I'm doing better. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, does it make a difference with the vaping? Do they say that's better for you? Or have you tried that? You know, I tried vaping. I, I actually was on the Dead Daisy stores in the Dead Daisies. And yeah. uh, we, were, we were in Croatia. And I, it was two in the morning and I smelled something funny. I'm like, what the hell is that smell? So I turned the light on on my nightstand and there it is sitting on my nightstand, smoldering. The thing had, had exploded and caught on fire. I'm like, okay, and I'm done. I'm, that was it for me. No vaping again. Give me cigarettes. And the European cigarettes are not that great. So I, I was toughing it out. But yeah, yeah, I won't vape. Oh, that's great. When, I forget, were you in the Dead Daisies when Karabi was there or was it Glenn yes. Hughes both? Yeah, I was in both. I was there with okay. Karabi for uh, for a record and uh, two tours. And then um, uh, John decided to take a, a little hiatus. So they brought Glenn Hughes in. So I did the record with Glenn Hughes and then Journey called. And it was like, well, I'm, I'm going, you know? Yeah. and uh, cause, Yeah, because how long have you been in Journey now? It's been a while, right? Yeah, I started in 98. Um, 98, uh, yeah. Yeah, 98 and uh, took some time off uh, to to get myself better as a person and um, rejoined in uh, 2021. Yeah. So well, a long time. Cause you were there. Were you there when uh, Jeff Scott Soto was the singer? Like briefly, uh, he, he was in the band, right? Yeah. In uh, 2006, Steve and Jerry was having issues, vocal issues. And um, <clears throat> so uh, they had uh, Jeff come in and fill in while, while Steve, you know, mended his voice. And uh, yeah, so he was in the band for, for the whole rest of the Def Leppard tour and uh, some some one-offs and stuff like that. And then Neil just thought, well, you know, we need to have that signature sound. And Jeff is unbelievable, undeniable front man, unbelievable vocalist. And I thought he was fantastic with the band. But, you know, Neil's the visionary. And he, he you know, so he started looking online and uh, came across Arnell by happenstance. And the story is uh, that... Uh, he kept calling Arnell and Arnell kept hanging up on him, thinking it was a joke, you know, one of his buddies. And finally he just said, look, 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 do not hang up. This is really Neil Sean from Journey. Don't hang up. And talked and and uh, brought him out and and he sang and it was undeniable. Just what a voice and what a person. What an amazing man. But boy, his vocals and his front man, you know, his front man antics. I mean, he's a, he's a badass. He really is. But was there another guy? I thought I heard you say there was two people you auditioned. Who was the other person? I don't know who that is. The guy, his name was uh, Jeremy. I think it's Hunt, Huntsinger. He was in a tribute band. And it, it was eerie because not only did he sound identical, but even his the, his the way he looked and the way he moved, it was like, wow. And I think Neil was kind of freaked out by it. Like, that's that's just <laughs> too close. That's too close. Wow. So, yeah, so we ended up getting Arnell, and, and boy, I mean, Arnell can sing anything. He can sing the phone book. The guy you tell him to sing Nat King Cole, bro, the man can sound like Nat King Cole. It's amazing. He's like a chameleon. And, and the way he works the crowd, he's just fantastic. He's amazing to watch. I mean, the first show we did was in uh, Vina Del Mar in, in Santiago, Chile. And, um, I'm playing and literally like my head's going like this, like watching this guy run across the stage, hitting all the notes, not missing, not out of breath, running like a madman, jumping up my riser. I'm like, oh, all right, man, we got somebody that's, that's you know, not only got the voice, but he can entertain. And, and he's the most humble, sweetest guy you'll ever meet. Arnell is, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, he's a precious man. Really good heart. 
And, and, and you have a really good relationship with Neil because I mean, it goes back so far. He's been so loyal to you taking yeah. you with bad English and hardline and then bringing you along uh, with journey. How yeah. are you able to have that relationship with him? Um, because you know, the, I just see headlines. I've never met, met Neil, but I mean, there's a lot of bad press about Neil. He's a bad, you know, th- he did this, he's that he's being sued, all this stuff, but you seem to be able to get along with him. Well, well, you know, I know Neil, we're like brothers, dude, for real. I mean, he never had, he was an only child and, and he took me under his wing and taught me how to play for a song and, and taught me how to lay into a pocket. I mean, he's, Dude, it's 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 musically, you know, uh, he changed my life musically and career wise. But I know the man and a lot of people don't know the man. They see the guy that is very protective of his child and journey is his baby. So I you don't I mean, you can't fault him for for, you know, going off on people that try to kill it. You know, I would, too. That's my child. I'm going to defend it till the day I die. Uh, But I know Neil and Neil is a softy. He's a teddy bear. You guys don't know that. But he is the sweetest man, and he's gone to bat for me. You know, when I had my issues, I, he called. You know, he called and kept in touch. Jonathan as well kept in touch and, and you know, always was there for me. And, and but you know, Neil, I owe him my career, dude. You know, Jesus Christ and him, I, I got to say, you know, he always kept me working, always kept me busy, always kept me with him. And um, he's real, you know. he There's no gray area with Neil. It's black or white. And I admire him for that. You know, uh, his playing speaks for itself. You know, it speaks for itself. Well, but course, the man, course, yeah. if, you, if you knew who he was, the man that he is, I know him really, really, really deeply. And I, I take bullets for that man forever. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. Are things better there with the journey oh, yes. camp? Because I know there's oh. been some drama, but you also said, like, as soon as you guys get on stage, all the drama goes away. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what we did the last couple of years because there were some some issues, you know, between Neil and John. But that's what brothers do, man. They fight. I mean, I have issues with my brothers, my blood brothers. So, you know, stuff happens, you know, miscommunications, uh, things are, are said wrong or taken the wrong way. But they mended fences this year and uh, actually last year, just before this tour started. And everything is, it, dude, it's like it was when we first started, when I re- when I joined the band in 98. It was like all for one, one for all. Let's go out and slam it. And that's what we do. It's been great. Do you have any advice for other bands on how to mend those fences? Because there's other bands that I would love to see mend the fences. Yeah. But how they Swallow your them. pride. That's, I, that's all I said. Swallow your pride. Get the ego out of the way and work with each other. You know, don't, you know, when one guy's saying something, the other guy's saying something, it's going on social media and people are doing it in the press. Number one, keep it out of the press. Number two, Talk, you guys, if you're creative like that, it's a spiritual thing. It really is. Uh, Art is very spiritual. And um, that's what I'd say. And that's what they had to do. They had to sit down in a room and just go, okay, let's hash this out. Because this thing's bigger than the both of us. It really is. This music is bigger than than one or two guys in a band. Uh, So uh, that's what I'd say, man. Get rid of the egos, you know, get get that out of the way. Swallow your pride. I mean, even if you you feel you're right, you know what? Look at the other guy's point of view and try and understand before you are understood. You know what I mean? Good advice. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And you guys have an awesome, I'm really excited for this tour that's coming up this summer. It's Def Leppard, Journey, Steve Miller Band, Heart, and Cheap Trick. Oh, yeah. Dude, how long are you each doing a set for? I mean, I don't know if I can stay that long. I, I'm old now. <laughs> 20 minutes each, bro. And then we just have fireworks this place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think everybody's, it's going to be a long day, but um, it's going to be hits. crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I'm going to be be there for the whole thing because I'm a huge, massive Cheap Trick fan. And I love heart. I've always had a a, a, a big soft spot in my heart for Ann Wilson. What a voice, man. Oh, just have you ever met her? And bro, oh yeah, we toured with she him. So nice, dude. In 2012, we did a tour, and that's when I first met her. And it's, they're so humble. But yes. man, that girl, that girl can can rip your face off. Her voice is wicked, wicked, and great every night. She don't suck ever. I mean, she's one of those girls, you know, one of those artists that can just go out there and smoke it. You know, voice could be rough or whatever, but it's, she still nails it. And it's, it's such admiration for for both those ladies. Amazing, groundbreaking. Yeah, it, that's exactly, you nailed it. She's so humble. Like she's so yeah. down to earth. You'd think with that level that you would just be like cocky and like think that other people are below you. And she is not like that at all. Like she no. treated I think, her equal, which was amazing. Exactly, bro. I mean, that's, the, I, I think that's because, you know, they were in a, you know, women in a man's world and, and they had to, they had something to prove, but they always, 
I, I believe they're very grateful. You know, they still are very grateful for not only what they get to do still, what they've done and the legacy that they built. I mean, that's massive, bro. You know? Yeah. Well, you've got a pretty good legacy of your own going here. I mean, we talked journey, we talked a little hard line, but t tell me a little bit about, I had a question about um, your time with Ozzy because yeah. I thought I heard you say, and then I, I was like, Oh, maybe I misheard you, but I mm -hmm. looked it up. So you guys did do some songwriting with Bob Daisley. Did his song oh, make the record or I, cause then I didn't see that they were credited. I was confused. Well, yeah. I, you know, he was there when we were, um, we were writing stuff. It was myself, uh, Ozzy, uh, Steve Vai and Bob Daisley. And we were in New York writing stuff. We were just writing, writing songs. Bob was there. Um, and then they ended up uh, letting Steve Vai go, uh, and kept Bob and I there and then brought in some outside writers, you know, and then they, they realized, you know what, we just need to get Zach back. And so they brought Zach back in and uh, Bob left. So I don't know what he had contribution wise. I know he wrote some lyrics. He did some, some, some writing, you know, in that regard, but uh, it was geezer that came in and uh, with myself and, and Zach and dude, I remember Bob Thompson, who was Ozzy's longtime tour manager from, from Blizzard of Oz. And he made a comment once that really hit us all. He's like, you know, this is probably the best band Ozzy's had since Blizzard of Oz, which was just humbling, you know, to hear that. Um, so, you know, I don't know what Bob had to do with the writing part of it. I, all I know is that they kept me on. I was grateful with, uh, you know, for my tenure there, you know, I got to, to work with them for three years doing a record and uh, South American tour and uh, off to better things and bigger things. So, you know, here I am. The songs that you guys did with Bob, did, did you, do you remember if those made the record or like, is there a recording of those? Like with the ones with Steve Vai, like, I'd, I'd just be curious to hear that. Like, that sounds interesting. You know, I, I don't know if Bob stuff made the record or not, because I wasn't really privy to who was writing and what was writing at that time. Uh, I mean, we were all just coming in and here's a demo or yeah. here's a song. Let's work it up and play it. But, you know, the stuff that Vi wrote was killer. I mean, just just amazing. Uh, you know, I uh, just I don't think that that um, that it was really Ozzy's thing. But uh, Vi's a genius, you know, I mean, it's it's undeniable there, too. The guy's a genius. So can't put anything, you know, past that guy for, for what he contributed at that time. But I think, you know, Ozzy was, Ozzy used to a certain thing and a, and a set thing, and he was so used to Zach. I think that Zach is like, like I am with Journey, Zach's the perfect guy for Ozzy, you know? After Randy Rhodes, I, I think there were a lot of great guitars, but Zach put his stamp on that thing and 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 made it huge, you know? Yeah. What do you think about him in Pantera? Like, I mean, I think that's like a great uh, replacement for Dime. I mean, you can never replace Dime, but if you're going to try to do those songs, he's the guy that you would get. Dude, totally. I mean, I've only heard snippets, you know, uh, online and stuff on YouTube and stuff. I haven't seen the concerts or anything, but uh, oh yeah, Zach fits in. Those guys are, they're all brothers, you know, they all kind of do the, you know, did their stuff together. I don't know if Pantera and Ozzy did shows together, but there's always that guitar circle, you know, Every, all the guitars know each other and they're all, you know, admiration for mutual admiration, respect society, you know, they all love each other. And I think, you know, Zach is the perfect fit for that. I mean, you know, they're going out on the road, and they're doing stuff, but I mean, who can replace Dime? Not very many, man. Dime, even Neil said Dime was a freaking monster. So, you know. Oh, really? Uh, Zach, Neil talks about, that's interesting. Oh yeah. You know, you, you know, I've asked Neil about a lot of guys. I actually took Neil to a Slipknot show. What? Uh, you know, he's like, I don't want to see this stuff, man. I'm not into that kind of music. The bro, just come with me. You'll get it. You're a musician. You'll get it. And he watched the show and he was like, damn, these guys throw down. So yeah, Neil admires a lot of guys that you wouldn't think he does, but Neil's an artist. He's a musician. It's like telling Picasso, you know, remember telling Picasso, your paintings suck. You know what I mean? It's hard to do that, you know, because yeah. it's art. It's their expression. And Neil gets it, you know, and, and I think Jim Root and uh, Mick Thompson love Neil. So, you know, yeah. it was a huge thing. And I'm a huge fan of Joey Jordan. And I, God rest his soul. He became a really sweet friend of mine. And, and, you know, mutual admiration society. We would text together and stuff. You know, and I'm, you know, huge fan of his work. I mean, to me, oh, yeah. all there was a lot was, of those kinds of yeah. things where a lot of people, those heavier bands are huge fans of Neil, right? I had a guy that was a thrash guitar player and he said yeah. he was at some festival with Neil Sean. He's telling some story about security. He's like, who are you? And they're like, and he's like, this is Neil Sean. <laughs> like, yeah, wake up, man. Dude. Like, <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Neil never got his due. I, I, I really don't believe that because of Journey. You know, Journey was a band. And, and Neil, even though he created the most amazing solos on the planet and melodies on the planet, 
People never recognized him for the shredder that he really was. He was a blue shredder. He wasn't those one of those, you know, riffy freaking, you know, uh, pan, you know, whatever those scales are where they're, you know, they're doing sweeps and all that. That wasn't his style. But I'm telling you, he burned it. When he played blues, he, to me, he was the fastest burning blues player ever next to Bonamassa and, and Lukather. Those guys are the kings of that. And Neil was the pioneer of it, in my opinion. He was a pioneer. Well, and isn't it too... Um... It's a, it's emotion, right? Like you can, you can feel the emotion. It's not just cause I mean, no offense to like Malmsteen or those kinds of guys, but some of that just seems like, you know, it's like technical, yeah. but I'm not really feeling the emotion from that. Whereas with, yeah. with Sean and like slash and those kinds of guys, it, it just feels like there's more emotion yeah. involved. It's from the heart, dude. That's what I love about Neil. I mean, I play with all those, you know, the shredder guys. I've, I've worked with a lot of them and they're all amazing in their own right. But Neil's just got this thing, man. And, and it's a gift from God. It really is, man. I mean, when he throws down, he throws down, but it's got passion. It's got fire. Right. It's not just, I'm going to put riffs in for riff's sake. I'm going to rip this thing for ripping sake. There's a, there's a, there's a method behind the madness. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. when he plays, it, I, when you hear him play, it's undeniable. It's like, yeah, that's Neil Sean, man. I can tell. You play, you know, a bunch of blues guitars that got that same feel. I go, yeah, that's Neil. I've worked with him for so long, you know, but he's just got something that nobody else has and never will have. He's, yeah. He's, and he never got his due. And that, in, in some ways, it pisses me off because he should have. You know, when those Shredder guys came out, they ruled the world, man. They ruled the Sunset Strip. But it was guys like Neil that, you know, paved the way. And then playing those blues riffs at, at warp speed, dude. And they're clean and they're precise and they got soul. Come on. Nobody yeah. touches it. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got to talk about the new, more about this uh, new Revolution Saints record. I mean, you've got a quite a, a couple of good players in this band, too. Yeah. Jeff Pilsen, oh, yeah. Joel Hoekstra, and oh. Alessandro, who we mentioned. Um, yeah. I mean, what is it like playing with those guys? And now you get to be kind of the front man and yeah. you're doing the drums and the singing. And so it's it's your, it's basically your project, right? Like you, Call the shots? Well, I, you know, and Serafino really and Alessandro kind of call the shots. They write the music. I mean, Serafino uh, is the president of Frontiers. So he put mm. he put Jeff and Joel in when Doug and Jack decided to to, to leave. And, uh, you know, I'm a big thing about chemistry. It, the chemistry has to be right. And uh, that was what I was kind of concerned about. I was like, well, what, whoever we get, you know, I got to be able to get along with them and they got to have a vibe, a good vibe. And man, Jeff and Joel were no brainers because I've worked with them before in, you know, Foreigner with Journey and White Snake with Journey. So I had relationships with them. And so when they came in, dude, it was like, yeah, I love it. And the playing, dude, speaks for itself. I mean, Jeff is a prolific songwriter, great singer, monster bassist. And then Joel, man, ah. Oh, Dude, he's like John Sykes on steroids. I mean, but he's just got that thing, you know, just like Doug. Doug has that thing, you know, that that raunchy guitar thing where Joel is a little bit more smooth. You know, he's got more of the smooth. He's got those shredder riffs, but he's got a lot of soul as well. So, you know, working with all of these guys, dude, was just, it's a dream come true. You can't find better players. And I wouldn't want to play with better players than what uh, Doug and Jack brought and what Jeff and Joel bring to the table. They're monsters. You know, I'm fortunate. You know, I'm yeah. like the guy that's the least, um, the least, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, accomplished at their instrument. I mean, I'm drumming one thing. I can, I know I play drums, you know, I do that really well. I'll keep my day job, but singing, dude, that ain't my forte. I'm still learning, still growing as a vocalist. I, um, I, I sound like Perry because I've been in Journey for so damn long and Steve Perry was my favorite singer, but it, it's like, I'm trying to come into my own and I'm starting to. But uh, I'm still a novice compared to those guys at their at their instruments. Yeah. Well, so do you want to? Would you want to branch out and try to sing something just totally different? Like, would you, or, or even play drums with something totally different? Like, do like a jazz record or like something totally like that? Well, for me, jazz man, I swing like a brick. You know what I'm saying? It's just I don't got that thing. I mean, Steve Smith is my all time favorite drummer. I mean, of all time. You know, I have a lot of great influences, but Steve really touched me and uh his playing i mean in journey it's undeniable he's a freaking animal but god if you hear him play his jazz stuff it's like i can't do that that's not you know i was born a rock drummer and I, again i swing like a brick i'm just like ding 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 ding, ding. i don't got any soul in that that's just not what i do but you give me a rock track and 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 you know i'll tear it to shreds you know well, I just, that's so just where you, i live yeah how do you pick um I, i'm not a drummer so how do you do the drum fills like the song uh will i see you again on the new record. How did you decide? That's a cool drum fill. Like, how did you decide how to do that? Like, is it just a feel or is it more of like a strategy? Like, okay, we got to do it this way or the producer helping you choose that? 
No, dude, you know what it is? It's usually one, the first take is the one we get. And I just go. I don't think about what I'm going to do. I play and whatever comes out, comes out. And that's the beauty of art, man. I mean, I, I never plan things out. I know Neil Peart used to tediously work on every drum part. And you can tell they're freaking, they're masterpieces. Uh, for me, I just fly by the seat of my pants, bro. And if it works, oh man, I listen back and go, I'll never be able to play that again. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a one-time thing and I'll have to learn what I did. Um, so I've always been that way. I, I've never really thought about what I'm going to do. I mean, there might be, you know, there's drum beats, obviously, and certain fills you do. But like when I go for a, a big fill and stuff, I just go. And if it comes out, great. And if it doesn't, like, okay, take two. <laughs> Punch me in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you, have you had I don't some, ever think about it. You've had some um, difficult, have you had difficult producers? Like I know, was it the Ozzy, the producer that was kind of giving you a hard time? And that's when Ozzy Dude. stuck up for you? Yeah, it, you know, uh, Michael Beinhorn, who's a dear friend of mine. I mean, very dear friend. He taught me a lot, dude. He actually, uh, he was going to get rid of me and get Jack Irons to play on the record. And I and it was, um, I was playing with the band. And I was nervous. I'm playing with Ozzy sitting there. You know, you got Zach, you got Geezer, and I'm the new guy. I'm like, oh, God. So I got nervous. So Michael said, you know what? Send the band home. And I said, Mikey, give me a chance. On, this is Osmosis. Said, I said, give me a chance. I know the songs by heart. Okay, give me the click track, turn it on. I'll find the I'll find where I'm at and I'll turn it off and we'll just go. And I did six songs in one take without the band there, just by memory. And Michael was like, there it is, bro. There it is. There it is. So I was having red light fever, just having Ozzy Osbourne in the freaking room, you know? But after that, I mean, Michael hired me for Hole. He hired me for a band called Foam. I did social distortion with him. So I did a lot of stuff. I was like his new guy. His, you know, Jack Irons was his guy for a long, long time. And then I kind of did what Jack did. And, and Michael took me to, to those records. And he's a dear friend. And now his son, Marius, is a drummer. I gave his son a drum set at like six. And the kid is ripping it to shreds. He's a badass. He's like eight now. And he's just, he's tearing it up. No lessons, just by heart. It's in him. So, you know, Michael and I are very close. But yeah, he was hard on me. And it was good for me. It taught me a lot, dude. Yeah, yeah so dude. Is you know what? Yeah. So like, what is your advice for that? Like, how do you make an impression with these people and continue to get the gigs? Like I said, like Neil Sean is so loyal to you and, uh, you know, working with these people, is it just continue to trying to improve and work with them and not get, let the ego get involved? Cause you could have said, screw you. I'm a great drummer and walked out of there too. Right? right. You know what it was for me, bro. It's like, whatever the producer says goes, it's their vision. Even though it's our songs, mm -hmm. the producer has the vision. And you've got to give this guy his vision. You've got to realize his vision or it's not going to work. And that's what I tried to do. I tried to get into Michael's head and go, okay, what are you looking for, bro? What do you want here? And he's like, you know, I need the bass drum to be a little, a little behind, right? And I want you to pop the snare a little harder. I want it to feel like that, like a rocking horse almost. He taught me a ton, bro. So always advice, play what the producer wants. There was a track on a journey record that we were having a hard time and Neil had a vision for it. He's like, man, I'm hearing the drums doing this. And John was like, ah, no, man, I'm thinking Dino should do this. And I just went, guys, stop, stop. Kevin, Kevin Shirley, producer said, what do you want? And he goes, well, play something. So I played a beat. He goes, that's what I want. Play that. And that was it. Do what the producer, realize the producer's vision or you'll be there all day long and you'll waste a ton of time and money. Right. That's good. That's great advice. Unless, unless you're the producer yourself producing, then you can do whatever you want, but exactly. No, I always have just worked with producers. They do. What do you want? I'm, I'm your right hand guy. Tell me what you want. Yeah. I will give you what you want, but you just got to tell me I'm not a mind reader. So. Right. So all the pe great people you worked with and what is your bucket list? Like Corey Taylor, Elton yes. John, Paul McCartney and James Taylor. Those are the four okay. that have eluded you. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, you know, Elton John has uh, Nigel Olsen, who's a, an icon and and one of the greatest drummers of all time. People don't know it. They don't. I mean, if you really analyze Nigel's stuff on like someone saved my life tonight or goodbye yellow brick road. I mean, his playing is phenomenal and it's, it's got a lot of color. Um, I'd love to work with Elton John, uh, Paul McCartney, of course, man, he's a beetle all day long if I could, but you know, they got Abe Laboreal Jr. Who again, a singing drummer, a monster drummer, monster vocalist, James Taylor. I just is near to near and dear to me because when I was a little kid, I can remember walking around with the little AM radios, you know, with the one earplug, you know, the little head headphone thing. 
And I listened to Fire and Rain uh, on the radio all the time. And it was one of my favorite songs as a kid. And Corey Taylor, just a genius, man. I mean, in my opinion, spoken word stuff, the books he writes, the lyrics. And, and you know, I was I would have loved to have been in Stone Sour because that's my wheelhouse, dude. Heavy, heavy music with melody. You know, and I would have loved to work with them. Maybe, you know, someday I'll be able to. I mean, yeah, I, if I can be with any of those guys. He's got a What's solo that? thing. Corey Taylor has a solo band, right? Yeah, Corey M and F and Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great, but, you know, he's got his band and, you know, I'm older than him, you know. I'm, I think I'm like 10 years older than he is. So it'd be like hiring grandpa to play on his record. I don't think he wants to go there, but, dude, I do it. I do it for free. I pay him. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, that's it. we'll put that out in the universe. Yeah, uh, Corey, I'll, if you listen, I'll do it for nothing. Yeah, I'll let you get going in a minute, but I did want to talk about this because I thought this was so cool. Um, tell me about this work you're doing with the prison population, because I think oh, that's a cool. really important issue that's uh, so often ignored. And I think there are two schools of thought. There's some people who say, lock them up and throw away the key. And there's another school of thought that says, let's let everyone out. Prisons are terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think either one of those strategies work. So what are you doing yeah. when you go into the prisons? What kinds of uh, things are you talking about? Well, we, we haven't started it yet. We're going to start in um, in uh, June when I have my time off before the Def Leppard tour. But basically go in there, I'll play some songs, you know, with my V-Drum kit, sing, you know, <clears throat> you know, to tracks. But then just give my my story, bro. I mean, you know, because, you know, I had a long, long issue with drugs for years and years. So just kind of tell them you know, that, that there's hope, you know, that God can restore you. You know, I, I mean, who in a million years thought that after getting fired from Journey, um, after six years, they'd bring me back. You know, and it was just like, you know, I had to focus on staying clean and, and I had my screw ups. I'd relapse and screw up in and out. But, you know, I got it today and I'm grateful. And that's just it. Just say, man, there's hope. You know, there's hope in Christ in my, you know, that's that's how I got through it was through Jesus Christ. I mean, I couldn't do it any other way. I really had to just lean on on God. And, um, you know, here I am. And, and that's all I'm saying is that, you know, there's OK, there's three thoughts on this. You get jail, institutions or death. OK, I hit jail. I didn't hit the institutions yet, not the mental places, but I was close to death, bro. So it was one or two, one or two, either jail or die. So, you know, thank God I didn't die because I was doing drugs that would have killed a, an elephant. I was doing some serious amounts of drugs. Uh, I had a lot of money on my hand and, uh, and my hands and, and a lot of time. So um, that's it. It's just going and, and giving them hope, man. You know, when you're out, don't go back, you know, don't, try and better your life because I lost it all, dude. I was yeah. I was making bajillions. I was doing great. I was a partner in the band. I was doing really well. I lost it all. But I think didn't that, lose. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the hope I think is a good I I cuz when I for me personally like when something bad happens, I try to use that as fuel to motivate yes. me. Whereas I feel like some people and yourself included myself in the past where you you use that as a tailspin to go deeper and further down. But if you can use that to go, you know what? I'm going to use this as a motivation to get back on track. Yeah, exactly, bro. And what a comeback. I'm grateful every day, dude. You don't know what it's, what, you, what you've got till it's gone. You know, the old Cinderella song. And it's true, man. I mean, I lost it all. And to come back and, and with uh, open arms, I had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> After I went my separate ways, you know. No, I'm grateful, dude. Every day, I don't get the smile off my face. To get a second lease on this, you know, not just on life, uh, but but with the band, you know, and, and life, you know, just, I, you know, my wife and I are, I've, I've never been better. Yeah. We have our arguments, but I'm, they're not drug fueled anymore. You know what I mean? So it's a great thing. God, my kids who respect me, my, you know, my, my grandkids. It's, and I, I found out who my friends were definitely found out who my friends were when that happened. Cause 90% of them scattered a lot of them, you know, just, you know, I don't want to talk to me. So I was grateful that I had a good support system and, and great people around me. So I mean, that's all I'm going to do is just, you know, tell them my story. And if my story changes somebody's life, then that's, you know, I did my job. I got to yeah. give back, man. I mean, I, I'm good at, at two things, being a musician and using drugs, you know, I, sadly. So if I can use my experience, strength and, and hope to get people off them or, or to curb them from it and to see that, man, you can do it. You can come back from nothing and from rags to riches, you know, to, you know what I'm saying? To rags Absolutely. again and to riches again. It's like huge, bro. Huge. Yeah. And Very I give all great about it. Yeah. I love it. Well, we got the journey tour this summer, the Revolution Saints. A couple songs are out right now. When does the I forget when the full record comes out? Um, I'm gosh, I think it's February 9th, the day we start our tour. Okay. So we start in Biloxi, Mississippi, 
And we're going until uh, April 29th. So, yeah, that's when the new uh, Rev record is coming out. So go out and get it, guys. And you still have not done a lot of live shows with Revolution Saints. Would that ever be in the cards? Yes, dude. I mean, uh, the the thing that's always deterred us, it deterred us with Jack and Doug were our schedules. We were just too damn busy. I mean, Dead Daisies work, man. They don't play. Those guys work hard. Night Ranger as well. I mean, that's Jack's baby. He's not going to walk away from that. That's his. That's his baby. And I'm, you know, my bread and butter's Journey. You know, and I'm my my loyalty is to Neil, you know, and John and the band. So, um, if schedules permit, God, we all want to play. I mean, I would love that. This is what I'm saying. If I could. Be a front man. I'm going to give it one shot, dude. I'm going to give it one shot. And if I suck at it, at least I said, you know what? I gave it a shot and I sucked. But at least I still got my day job. I can still play drums all day long. That's that's yeah. all that matters. I'm going to give it yeah, a shot. Yeah, from what I've I heard, you sing amazing, I think. I, I think you would kill it. I think it's definitely way above average. So I don't think you give oh, enough you. credit. But uh, people oh. can check it out and hear the songs for themselves. A couple oh. songs are out right now. And then I'll, the, the back catalog is available, too, of course. Awesome, bro. Thank okay. you, man. Thanks so much, bro. I appreciate you, man. Nice you to have meet a great you. Have man. You, you too. too. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.